Super size me. So we're gonna talk about people's bodies, right? Yeah, man. Talk about being big. Big bodies, little bodies, fun bodies, healthy bodies. What's that about? Well, dude, I don't know, but you know everything's bigger in Texas. I hear that. Is McDonald's pretty big in Texas? Huge in Texas. Do you love McDonald's? Dude, look at me. Does a bear poop in the woods? <laughs> I do not know who that is supposed to be. <laughs> One of the things that I am most blessed with in Westside is that we have a pastoral team that leads as a group. We don't work with a senior pastor model here. If you've been around long, you know that. There are nine of us that make decisions together, nine of us that try to advance the kingdom together, and we are grateful for that opportunity. The cool part is one person can fall in a ditch pretty easy. It's hard to pull nine folks into that same ditch. We also use a team teaching approach, and I love this because, to be honest, 35 years into doing this, the truth of God's Word kind of falls in three categories for me. There are parts of it that I have practiced for years, and I feel pretty comfortable teaching those parts. There's a group in the middle that I've gotten right some of the time and struggle with at other times, and I, I can feel okay with those. But there's this category over there of stuff that I still really struggle with that while I can teach the theory, it's hard to teach it with power and with strength because I haven't successfully lived it out. Today's teaching falls in that category. Here's the big idea for this entire series. God expects us to take our beliefs and hold them up, examine them against the Scripture. He expects us to take whatever we believe from whatever source we got it, mama, daddy, grandpa, grandma, church, experience, logic, emotion, doesn't matter where it came from, you hold it up against the Scripture. And we've been doing this cow tipping thing, taking some truths that we are know are not quite right. Here's today's truth. God only cares about my spiritual life. That's the cow we're tipping today. He only cares about my spiritual life. He's not too concerned about my physical health, my financial health, my emotional health, my mental health. If I got the spiritual part of life right, I'm okay. Nothing could be further from the truth. So we've got one of our pastors today that is absolutely dead on to teach this subject. Would you give a hand to Troy Kennedy as he comes to share? <laughs> Wow. Um, no pressure. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say this, guys. Um, I got to know how much I respect and love that man and uh, how rare it is to find in a leader of his stature the kind of humility and character that you find in Dan Sutherland. The fact that he would allow me to come and share this with you is a tremendous honor. So I don't take that lightly at all. And I, yeah, yeah, give him a hand, man. He's an amazing guy. And I have approached this topic with great fear and trepidation, okay? Today we're talking about God and your bod. And, uh, and I tell you what, you know, I don't know about you, but I have personally sitting in church for years and years and years, I've never heard a message on this uh, from the platform. And so we may find out today that there's a reason for that, but uh, we're going to take a stab at it here. And, and there's a couple things. What I don't want you to hear, is, and please, man, get this. This is not meant to sound, you know, generous or magnanimous, but I love you guys. And the last thing I want to do is for anyone here to feel picked on or singled out or self-conscious. You know, you didn't want to come to church and find a new thing to feel bad about. That, that is not the point at all about this. What I desperately want you to know is that just like a heavenly father who, who loves us and how we love our kids, we want them to live rich, healthy lives that have purpose and have direction and they're everything that they could be. And when God calls us to something, he does it for a reason. It's not an accident that he, he talks about the way he does in Scripture. And today, the idea is to give us a biblical framework for how we treat these bodies that he has given to us. So please, don't, don't, don't hear that someone's going to walk out of here feeling self-conscious, you know, but maybe a little discomfort today, maybe a little pain today is going to save us from much greater pain later and help us to live lives more the way he's called us to live them. 
And something else I don't want you to hear here, I, I'm not, we're not going to impose some kind of cultural standard on us that tells us the way we're supposed to look, okay? We're not looking to Hollywood and some superhero that was in a movie, right, you know, who, or, or, or looking on a magazine cover and seeing some girl, because the truth is, those guys don't even really look like that. Hey, you know what? If I was making a million bucks and it was my job to look awesome, I'd look pretty good. You know, I have a fleet of trainers and cooks and everybody just because my whole job is to look great on screen. And between steroids and anorexia and Photoshop, those people don't even really look like that. <laughs> so that's not the standard. We've never bought into a standard the culture sets for us. And I'm not talking about buying into a standard that even a local culture sets for us. Could be the Midwest. It could be the South. Could be the way they just said, well, this is just how we are here. We've accepted it and that's it. Our standard as Christ followers has always been different. And today we want to give you a biblical framework where God is calling us to be. And what I'm not talking about here is, you know, whether you're heavy or whether you're skinny. Because the truth is, a thin person can be just as unhealthy as someone who might have a little bit, a bit of extra weight. And I, honestly, that's my story. You know, I've always been, believe it or not, kind of a slender guy. And, and you would never know, looking at me, that I, you know, I had any health struggles or anything. But I tell you what, man, I was one of those guys that kind of let it ride. You know, I would eat whatever, do whatever, neglect whatever. And, and when we moved here uh, to Kansas from Los Angeles, we got immediately, as soon as we hit the ground, man, it was just nothing but stress. It's hard enough to move. But then you add, oh, my children were getting sick, and we had, you know, stress at work. The church kind of had a blow up at one point. And I was just kind of, I wasn't doing anything for my body. I was eating everything I wanted to eat and just kind of going along with it and dealing with all the stress. And a couple of years ago, I got sick. And I wound up, I had a case of diverticulitis, which is like a, a, an intestinal infection, and, uh, and I had a hernia. And as I'm laying in a hospital bed, looking at my children, who were like five and six years old, and my wife, I'm going, this ain't happening. These guys are too young. And you know what? They don't just need me to be around. They need a better version of me around. Because it, I was just kind of tired and beat up and sick all the time. And I didn't want to engage. It was just like, it was just getting really sad. And as you get older, you know what? Your body starts to turn on you. Anybody want to testify? Okay. So it, it's one of those things that we have to deal with very directly. And God kind of woke me up to that. And and I started seeking out scripture and start seeking out more information. And well, what does this really mean? How, how do I deal with my physicality? Is How do I manage my age well? How do I be there the best possible version of me for my wife and for my kids? And that's what I want to share with you guys today. What does God say about our, uh, our bodies and how we manage them? So here's your first feeling, right? Your body was made by God, for God, to honor God. Your body was made by God, for God, to honor God. Right? A lot of us, we look at life like this, okay? Over here, this is, this is a wagon wheel, in case you thought I was going to like say, hey, ahoy, okay? Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a wagon wheel. And we can look at it like this. Every spoke in here is kind of a different facet of our lives, a different part. Of, we, got our, we might have our physical life. We have our relational life, our parent life, our vocational life, our friend life. We've got all these different things. And we know it's, we want to have a healthy life, all these different areas. We want to manage them well, have them be well balanced, right? But whether you believe it or not, there's always something at the hub, and what you put at the hub determines really how strong this wheel is. And it informs all the spokes in the wheel. Okay? Now, you might have something at the hub that maybe shouldn't be there. Like it might be your kids might be the hub of the wheel. Right? Ha oh, That's kind of scary. Right? You might have your vocation. You might even have your fitness at the hub of the wheel. And if you have some of the things like that, the wheel has a tendency to be weak. Sometimes it can collapse on the weight of it because its hub is strong. And I got to tell you this, guys, whether you're a Christ follower or not, whatever you believe this or not, what you believe about your relationship with God, about what Scripture says, determines what the hub of the wheel is. Like it or not, what, if you believe there was a creator who made you with a purpose that we are accountable to, that is the hub of the wheel. If you believe that there is no God and there is no purpose of life and all this is just kind of random, that is the hub of your wheel because that determines the purpose for living. And that purpose for living informs every other area of our lives, whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, it shapes us and energizes us in every conceivable way. That's just how we're wired, guys. And the problem is we tend to make God, we make our relational life as another category. And i got to tell you this, your relationship with God, this is your next feeling, is not a category what you believe about him and your relationship with him is the hub of the wheel. And it might be stable or unstable, but it informs everything, including how we treat our bodies. 
Now, we all tend to fall into two categories, all right? We got the body worshipers, and we got the body neglectors. And they do not get along. Okay? They don't like each other at all. You got the body worshipers who are the ones who are like, you know, maybe very consumed with their physicality, you know, and they go on Facebook and they, they, they write about like the next workout and how they got like 15 inch biceps, you know, and the body neglectors are like, what a jerk, you know? And then, and then you got the body neglectors over here bragging about how they set the record at Buffalo Wild Wings last night. And the body worshippers are looking down the nose at those guys like, ah, oh, get it together. The truth is, both of those perspectives are a little bit jacked up. Right? And we, now I want to talk for a minute just to, to the body worshipers, right? Because you say, I'm not really a body worshiper, but, you know, I take one handful of vitamins a day, but I know somebody who takes two. Or I only work out five times a week. I know somebody who works out seven times a week. Well, I'm not, I'm, I've never looked in the mirror and said, I am bigger than the air I breathe. I've never worshipped my body. <laughs> But the thing is, it probably takes an inordinate amount of time and energy. You know, you probably spend a lot of money. You care about what you look, you know. You figure you worked out really hard in the gym. You're going to wear something because like, you kind of accessorize so that everybody knows how, how hard you worked out in the gym. Or maybe you worked out so hard and you still can't quite get it right. And so you go through the pain and the expense and the time of plastic surgery to try and get it right. Matter of fact, how many people in the room have had plastic surgery here today? Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Yeah. In <laughs> Calf implants, right? I was just guessing. Yeah, it looks very good on you, though. Yeah. It got real tense in here all of a sudden. These guys let me off the hook. I was kind of hoping it would hang out there for a bit. Um, you know, and that's just kind of where our, our image is so tied up with how we look and how we deal with things that it's hard to get away. And I understand that. It's easy to obsess over that. And Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, right? Timothy is ministering in like this Greek culture. You know, they're obsessed with the body and with competition and the games. These are the people who came up with the Olympics. And Paul writes to Timothy, he says this, for physical training is of some value. Of course it is. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Paul is telling Timothy, hey, get the hub where it belongs. Get your relationship with God at the center because your physical training is valuable, but if it's everything to you, the wheel is going to collapse. Now, some of us are neglectors. We're body neglectors. I'm one of those, right? Walked as a neglector for a very long time. And, you know, I got to tell you this. You know, past athleticism is no mark of future health, okay? You feel me, okay? In the room, you know, a matter of fact, statistics tell us that only about 4% of people who were healthy in high school and college who were like athletes and sportsmen actually maintain a healthy life after they get out of school. Now, you might sit there and you might look in the mirror, you know, and you still see that 19-year-old kid. You're like, yeah. The truth is you're really looking at Homer Simpson. And we didn't get there overnight, you know. It's kind of a long slide, you know, when you're, you're a sportsman and you love it and you're over here. And then over time, you know, in your 20s, you have certain habits you've established. You can eat whatever you want. You can sleep whenever you want. You're like, dude, if I don't sleep for four nights in a row, I'm totally toast, right? I, can, I ate two pizzas last night, you know, and you go through and you establish these habits. And then you turn 30 and it's like, ah, oh, start, things start looking a little different. But I'm okay, you know, because you've always lived this way. You've established your tastes and your patterns and your habits. And you get to 30s, you can turn 40 and your body kind of turns on you. You know, and you get into this thing. It's like, how did I get here from here? You didn't get here by doing Eat 90X, all right? You got here. Some of you are going to get up in the middle of the night and watch an infomercial. Get really excited about that joke. Um, you didn't get there in 90 days. As a matter of fact, it's going to take a lot longer than 90 days for us to get out of there. You see, because the neglect happens over a long period of time. And then we, sometimes we act surprised when we get there. Now, which one are you? What camp would you put yourself in? Here's what I know. Here's your next feeling. Taking care of our bodies is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. And you're like, oh, great. The worship pastor is telling us it's an act of worship. Just bear with me for a second, okay? In Romans 12, 1, Paul writes to the Romans. He says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul is juxtaposing your physicality and your spirituality. The way you treat your body is a spiritual decision. It's an act of worship. They're interrelated. You can't get away from that. And that's the whole of our lives. Here, here's what I'm reluctant to say. Sometimes when we see that, and, and it can be equally translated, right? Physical body, and it also can be translated kind of the whole of your lives. But some of you have heard that in church before, and as soon as you hear this idea, oh, God, Paul really meant all of our lives. What you have effectively done is you've extricated your physical body out of that equation. Well, he's talking about all of my life, but not really my body. When he uses the word for body, 
in that verse. It is the whole of our lives, and it includes our bodies. Now look at this. How many of you church people, okay? How many of you ever heard, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? My body is the, okay, a lot of you heard it. Okay, good. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, nice temple. <laughs> Some of you, that's more excited than I've ever seen about that greeting before, by the way. Um, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, in our context, we don't really have a lot, we don't really understand what the temple is, okay? You don't see a lot of temples. It's, okay, temple, it's kind of this abstract church thing. But the thing is, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian culture, they were very intimate with what temples were. They were everywhere. On every corner, there was a temple to some kind of God, some kind of deity. And Paul, who was a Jew, knew exactly what the temple was in the Jewish context. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of weight behind that statement. So I want to paint a little picture for you, okay? Let's go back, like several hundred years and, and, and get your uh, Charlton Heston on, the Ten Commandments, okay? And we got down here, we got God delivering Israel from the Egyptians and he leads them in the wilderness by a cloud, a pillar of cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. And Israel is literally led and fed by the Spirit of God and his, his presence with them is what sets them apart. You fast forward a little bit more. And Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and he gets the Ten Commandments and he brings those down. They put them in the Ark of the Covenant and, they, and then they build this thing called the tabernacle. The tabernacle is like, it's a tent, right? It becomes the place where, where the, the Ark of the Covenant sits. Any like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Ark fans, you know, you know what the Ark is? Okay, they put that in the, in the tabernacle. And this is where the manifest presence of God is located. Worship is now centralized on the tabernacle. And they carry this thing around as a nomadic people. The tabernacle is so important. And that tabernacle was designed very specifically by the hand of God through Moses. Exactly how it was going to look, its dimensions, its size, the implements and the tools that were used in it. Fast forward a little bit more. You go to Solomon. And Solomon says, we're no longer nomadic. We're centralized in Jerusalem now. We're going to build God a temple. And it takes many, many, many years to build this enormous intricate, beautiful structure, once again, directed by God. What kind of gemstones and precious stones and what kind of metals and implements and how it was going to be managed. And they built this curtain and behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies and, and the Holy of Holies where's the Ark of the Covenant again, representing the presence of God with Israel. And it's God's presence with them that makes them special. It's God's presence in the temple that sets them apart from the other nations. And worship was centralized on the temple. Fast forward again to Jesus. Okay, we had the temple, we had the sacrificial system that makes sure you bring an animal, you bring a goat, you bring something, you're gonna sacrifice it to God so that you know, know that you're okay with God. And Jesus pays the price once and for all as a sacrifice for sin. We don't need that system anymore. And Jesus says this, as he, when, after he rose from the dead, he goes to his disciples and he says, it's better for you that I go away because if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. The comforter is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, you know what? Worship is centralized on the temple over here. It has been in a physical location. Now, now, the Holy Spirit is going to come to you in Acts on Pentecost in Jerusalem to everyone who has been atoned for by the blood of Jesus. And now the temple is in your body. God is going to reside in your body, no longer in a geographical location. And it's in that context, with that kind of weight, with that kind of background, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, this is the temple. No longer is it in a location. No longer is worship centralized in Jerusalem. It's in the heart, in the body of everyone. And Paul is saying, you are the temple. You are the house of God. We don't worship the temple and we don't neglect the temple. The temple has value because of who resides in it. And we go down the street and we look at church buildings and say, there's a house of God, there's a house of God, there's a house of God. When the truth is, that's not true. This is the house of God. You and I are the house of God. You and I are the temple. We have value. We are separate, set apart because of the spirit of God that lives within us. That's what makes us special. That's what makes us different. And some of us, if this is a house of God, it's overdue for a house cleaning. Okay. <laughs> Some of us, it doesn't look like there's been an adult living there for the last 30 years, except it's more like, like a gang of teenagers, right? And they partied it up pretty good, right? And now the house has kind of got a leaky roof, and the plumbing is messed up, and there's a family of raccoons in the basement. <laughs> and it's time to clean house. Sorry, teenagers, I, you know, I'm sure you would never do that, yeah. Uh, 
But it's time to clean the house. It's time to maybe put a fresh coat of paint on that thing. It's time to fix the plumbing. It's time to maintain this in a way that's going to honor God because this is now the house of God. Secondly, taking care of our bodies is an act of stewardship. Now, stewardship is not a word we really use a whole lot. Um, Okay, I want you to wave your geek flag real high right now. How many Lord of the Rings fans in the room? Thank you. Yes, I'm not alone. I feel very validated right now. Lord of the Rings, okay, in the third book, third movie, okay, of Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, there's a city of men, it's called Gondor, right? And the city of Gondor has this guy. Now, if you were to look from the outside and see this guy, he looks like he's the king, okay? He's running the show, right? He is part protector and he is part manager. But he's called the steward of Gondor. The steward is just there taking care of business. The king actually went away. And when the king went away, he gave the keys of the kingdom to the steward and said, hey, your job is to protect this and maintain it and take care of it while I'm gone. Because when I return, I will then retain power. You and I are stewards of this body that God has given us. We are both part protector and part manager. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is a loner, gang. And the the guy who owns it is going to come back and call us into account for how we manage the resource that he gave to us. Just like every area of our lives. Now, if we take that... Take that city analogy a little bit further, right? Every city kind of has its deficits. It's got its weaknesses, you know? It might have issues with its sanitation. It might have issues with defense. It might have sketchy electrical or whatever it is. But, but we have to deal with those things. We have to be aware of them. We have to deal with them. And you and I are no different. If we can be called to manage these bodies, you know what? It's a broken world. It's a broken place. And our bodies are broken. And some of us got handed... You know, one stack of cards and others got another one. And we all have different weaknesses. And we have, this is in your notes. Why don't you write this down? You have to manage your weak spots. Manage your weak spots. Okay, here's the thing. I I have like horrific allergies. Like I'm pretty much allergic to air, okay? And and I have to deal with those constantly. And I take take medication and stuff. And I'm I'm allergic to cats, like in a pretty big way, you know? And I really like dogs. I'm not so sure God made cats, but I I like dogs. And... (laughs) But let's just say, just for the sake of argument, that I love cats, right? I'm really, I love, love cats. I'm enamored with cats. And so because I love cats, even though I'm allergic to them, I'm going to stick my face into a basket full of kittens, right? Now, after I burst into flames, <laughs> you're going to say, why, why did you do that? Well, I like, I like cats, but you're really allergic to them. Yeah, but I like cats. So I'm just, you know, we, we think that's kind of silly, but see, some of us, We've got different weaknesses. Our bodies are made differently. You know, you might have an allergy. I know a guy who has a chemical imbalance in his brain. When he gets off his medications, because, you know, for whatever reason, his life is a train wreck. Some of us, we have, you know, we, you might have issues with your knees. You might be dealing with, you know, a, a genetic disposition towards certain kinds of cancer. Maybe you've got a genetic propensity to put on unhealthy amounts of weight, okay, where somebody else doesn't really have that issue. We have to manage those weaknesses because that is how we are made. And it's not an excuse to say, that's just how I am. Accept it. It's like sticking your face in the basket full of cats. It makes no sense. Manage your weak spots. We take care of our bodies now because it is wise. It's a wise thing to do. I bet everyone in this room would say, it's a good idea to save for retirement, right? Because we know, we know, all you smart business people, that all those little decisions that you make, the little discipline of, of, of putting a little money aside, you know, getting to your 401k or your money market fund, every time you put that in there, you know over the long term that stacks up to big impact. Those little decisions you make right now add up to a quality of life later on. And we look in Scripture and it says, know the quality or, or know the condition of your flocks. And, you know, we don't want to start to build a house unless we know we have the resources to finish it. Scripture talks all the time about stewardship. And yet, we will neglect our bodies for decades and just think one day I'm going to take a pill and it's going to make it all good. And see, and I, this is what I know about you and I. We, our lives are the accumulation of all those small little decisions that we make every day, all those little, little disciplines that we have. And later on, It's going to affect our quality of life. And the truth is, it affects our quality of life now. Some of you have felt so poorly for so long, you don't even know. It's just normal. And God is calling you to something else. He's a loving Father. He cares about you and me. And He's not trying to put another obstacle in front of you, another thing for you to feel bad. He's calling you because He's not something better for you. And if we will honor Him with our bodies, with this resource, just like every other resource in our lives, He's promising us that It will benefit us, just like you look at your kids and you want to see them live whole, full lives. 
Look, I know this is really hard for a lot of us to hear. Some of you have struggled with this for a long, long time. You know, and, and you come to church and you're like, oh, great. Now, I'm not even safe at church. Or some of you have been worshiping, you know, for your body for a long time and it's been the sole source of your self-image and it's kind of like, maybe that's not a good idea, you know. Some of you here have got a lot of resistance still and you kind of have a hard time hearing me and you've got a litany of excuses that are going through your brain. You might be saying, you know what, this is just how I am, you know. It's just how I am. Now, how many of you would parent that way? Think about it. What if your neighbor knocks on the door and says, hey, your kid bit my kid. And you respond just going, oh, yeah, he's a biter. <laughs> yeah, it's just who he is. We've accepted this in him, and we love him. A neighbor turns around and says, well, he's 16. Yeah, I know. He's just a biter. <laughs> you, know, or, uh, you know, my five-year-old daughter, she took up smoking a little bit, and she seems to really like it. So we just think that's how she is. It's, you know, it's just we, we love her. for the, No one would parent that way, and yet we come up with the same lame excuses for the way we manage our lives. And guys, I promise you, your kids are watching. You are modeling for them what responsible behavior looks like for their future, just like maybe your parents did for you. It's not getting around them. Some of you are saying this. It's just the culture we live in, you know? I got news for you. Not all cultures are equally good, okay? Whether it's a culture in Hollywood that's telling us that there's some kind of aesthetic standard that is acceptable, you know, and that you're never going to have the body type to do that, so you're just doomed to feel poorly about yourself. Or it might be a local culture that says, hey, this is just how, you know, this is just how it is in the Midwest. This is just how it is in the South. This is what we eat. This is what we do. This is normal for us. You know, my mom is that way. My mama's mom is that way. My mama's mama's mom is that way. It goes all the way back to Eve. And we've accepted that this is normal and it's okay. Now, since when have we let the culture dictate to us what is acceptable as Christ followers? Since when is that okay? Paul, in the very first verse of Romans, he says, hey, how you treat your bodies is a physical decision. It is an act of worship. And in the very next breath, he says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world. There's a reason he follows that statement with this. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The culture is not what dictates, dictates to us what is good and what is normal. How about this? It's my body. I'm not hurting anyone. Hey, look, I'm not hurting anybody else. It's my body, and I've just chosen to deal with the repercussions of it. I'm going to enjoy life, and this is the way it's going to be. Listen, please. When you and I are irresponsible with our bodies now, it's the people that we love who wind up holding the bag. See, when I don't take care of my body now, it's the people who love me and I love later on that have to take care of my body. And what happens is when we neglect this and we don't manage it well, we cause undue stress, financial stress, stress on time, emotional stress on the people that we care the most about. It's not just about you. You might be saying, I don't have the willpower. I'm just weak. I'm weak. You know what? I like cheesecake, man. <laughs> I just like it, you know? I'm weak. Here's what I know. The Spirit of God will give you everything you need to do what He is calling you to do. God is not going to call you to something, call you some kind of standard, and leave you unequipped to do it. He calls us clearly to something that's by the Spirit of God that is within you that we get to ha we have any kind of victory at all in life. In 2 Timothy, it says this, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. The spirit within us is what enables us and empowers us to do that. And as you take a step towards God, he takes a step towards you. As we act in obedience to him, he comes and he meets us in the middle and he empowers us and he gives us the ability to transcend that thing. You and I are not slaves to our appetites and our urges and our whims. We are not animals. God has called us something. You and I are more than conquerors in Christ. Victory through the spirit of the living God that has made his dwelling your body and mine. And he's saying, here is the standard. And I will empower you and enable you to do what I'm calling you to do. He is a loving God. He's not a cruel God. And it is imminently accessible and doable for you and I. 
Not by might, not by strength, but by my power, says the Lord, that we are capable of doing any of this. And he promises to meet us in the middle. There are three things you need to get started here. One, an admission. Maybe it's time to admit that, you know, I've been a worshiper, man. I've been a body worshiper. I've had my, my body as the hub of the wheel, baby. The way I look, the way I accessorize, the way I dress, it's very, very, very important to me how other people perceive me. Or maybe, you know, you've had something else there. But to admit that I've been a worshiper, maybe I've been a neglector, and I've just been on the long downhill trail for a long, long, long time, and today God is uh, pushing me in something. Maybe it's time to admit that I've let it go. And I've not understood. May I just, no one ever told me that I had to honor God with this resource he gave me, just like every other resource that he's given me. It's an admission. And pray and ask God to direct you, empower you. Next, you probably need assistance. Maybe the most spiritual decision you can make today is tomorrow I'm going to call my doctor and make an appointment and get a physical. And I'm going to ask him, how do I manage this body well that is healthy and sustainable for the long haul? What do I got to do in my diet? Do I got to move? Do I got to exercise? Maybe the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. But you might need help with that. You might need a nutritionist, a trainer, somebody who's going to help you. We all need this, accountability. None of us can do this kind of stuff on our own. And you and I need people around us who know us and love us and not only going to encourage us and bless us in this, but maybe you're going to call us on the carpet. Maybe you say, you know what, when you sit in a restaurant, somebody's going to like, you know, whisper in your ear. It's like, you don't need to order that. Cheese sauce is a bad choice right now. <laughs> People who care about us and want to see us successful. You need to get in some community. We're starting a lifeline here in uh, September called Body and Soul. And it's going to be pr designed precisely to do that, for people to come together and to love each other and laugh together and to go on this journey together towards turning this thing around. See, Scripture promises one day the redemption of these bodies. You know, one day it's going to be the way it was supposed to be. And I'm banking on the fact that, like, in heaven, there's no low-fat, low-cal, low-carb, nothing. <laughs> I want all the carbs I can get, baby. But until then, you and I got to understand the way we manage this body is an act of worship. It's just smart. It's good stewardship because this body is a loner. You are not your own. It doesn't belong to you. And we are accountable to a creator who gifted us with this miracle of a body and all the different beautiful shapes and sizes and colors that are represented in this room. And he's saying, I gave this to you. Do something good with it. Your body was made by God, for God, to honor God. Let's pray. So Jesus I pray right now, Lord, for he people here. Some people are feeling, maybe they're feeling badly. They're feeling picked on. They're feeling singled out. And I just pray, Lord, that your grace go on them and uh, that we all understand that this is a journey. And as we take one little step, all those little steps, they add up. Day after day, they add up to something. But the heart of it is our desire is to honor you now, to make that first move in your direction, to realize this is an act of worship that we do. And that you pay the price for us, the highest possible price through the cross, that we are not our own. So we take this life in all of its complexity and all of its victories and failures and we offer it to you and pray that you empower us and give us courage and wisdom to do the best that we can with it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Wow. Thanks, bro. Love you, buddy. Wow. In October of 2009, my cardiologist looked at me and said, you better get God involved in your health. And over the next year, made some great steps toward that health. Lost 70 pounds, felt a lot better. October this past year, I kind of slipped into the gear of, I got it, God. I can handle it. No big deal. And 60 pounds back on later, I'm again at the place of saying, God, I have got to get you in this journey. I invite you to join me in the journey toward health. Now, there's not a perfectly healthy person in this group. We all struggle at some spoke in this wheel. 
but the hub has to be our relationship with Jesus Christ, and then we honor him by how we submit all along the way.